Hey everybody, welcome back. This is now officially, I believe, the seventh video in our performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis series. And this is where things start to get really good. Uh, because now we're presenting the results and the methods that uh, we developed to approximate full performance-based liquefaction hazard analyses for the CPT, but that don't require um, anything more than a simple spreadsheet with some correction equations. Um, we did all of the hard work in developing reference parameter maps, which I'll talk about in this lecture. And so um, it doesn't require you to run any probabilistic integrals or anything like that. And so um, walking through this lecture, it's important that you understand that um, I'll really only be presenting to you the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Um, and there's lots of equations that I'm going to throw at you at this, uh, in this lecture. So understand that if you want to dive in more um, and learn more about all of the methods that we analyzed, uh, I'm only going to present to you one of the liquefaction triggering methods, um, but we analyzed a few of them. Uh, if, if you want to learn more, uh, you can go down into the description box of this video and uh, access the final reports for this research and, and look at all that information and its, and its uh, greatness and glory for yourselves. But uh, for the rest of us, so for the rest of us, we just want to understand kind of what's going on. And that's really the purpose of this lecture right here. So let's just uh, dive right into it. So um, in the last lecture, we talked about the performance-based approach for liquefaction hazard assessment and it, it was really kind of kicked off by Kramer and Mayfield and how they took liquefaction triggering models and plugged them into a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis framework or a, a, a performance-based engineering framework that typically involves millions of iterative calculations and um, that's that's basically what it is but in the real world, in, in terms of practicality, there's few, if any, engineers that have the tools, the training, or the resources to apply that type of approach on everyday consulting projects. And so there needs to be a simplified method. And this really isn't a new idea. Uh, take, for example, if, if you've done any sort of uh, building or bridge seismic design in the United States, you're, you're already familiar with a simplified approach. I could ask you the simple question, um, when was the last time you performed a PSHA, or a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis? And you would probably say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't think I've ever performed one of those. And you're, you're right, you've never done the calculations. But if you've ever pulled ground motions from the U.S. Geological Survey and followed the procedure and code to correct those ground motions for your local site conditions, then you have effectively performed a PSHA. You see, the USGS and some very smart people developed an approach to closely approximate the results that you would get if you performed your own PSHA. Here's how they did it. So in their approach, the, by the way, NSHMP stands for National Seismic Hazard Mapping Project. So this is the team of elite scientists at the USGS that develops the seismic hazard maps that uh, we use in our building codes and our bridge codes and, and all of that. Now here we go. Here's the process that they do for this simplified method. They assume just a generic material, rock. And they assume that that material exists everywhere. Now, I know you, you may go, well, doesn't rock exist everywhere? Everywhere has bedrock. And yeah, that's true. But bedrock doesn't have the same properties everywhere. In some places, it's really fractured and, and it, it it, therefore, it's not very stiff. And in other places, it's, it's really solid and therefore is very stiff and elastic. And so um, in this case, 
they assume a generic bedrock material that has a shear wave velocity of 760 meters per second. And they assume that that bedrock exists everywhere. And then they develop a grid of points across the United States, and they perform a PSHA at every one of those grid points. Now this requires, of course, that they also have to have the, their own um, seismic source model which they do, and they update this model about uh, about every six years or so. It, it's due right now for an update, and um, actually it has been updated. We're just waiting now for the model to be implemented and to, to develop brand new maps. But with this generic seismic source model and with this generic material that they assume exists everywhere, even though it doesn't, but they assume it, they perform PSHAs at all of these grid points across the country. Then the next step is they go ahead and um, based on these grid points, they perform kriging or they perform interpolations and they develop contour lines at different return periods of interest. So this might be 2475 years or 475 years or uh, or 1033 years if you're in the transportation world and they're going to develop seismic hazard maps but seismic hazard maps for this generic rock material not for the actual material that's there at that site okay by the way these are what we call the seismic hazard maps Excuse me. And then you, the engineer, go to those maps. You pull off the mapped values for your site. And then you correct those mapped values for site effects that uh, are based on your local site conditions. So like the soil site classification, whether it's a site class A, B, C, D, E or even an F. And so you modify the mapped ground motion based on what your local site conditions are. And by the time you get done with that process, you have a probabilistic ground motion that is very, very close to what you would have gotten had you done your own PSHA uh, to begin with. And so do you see the process? In this, in this process, you went to a map, you grabbed a value, then you performed a, a modification to that value based on the information at your site, and now you have an approximation that's very, very close to what you'd get if you just did the full analysis in the first place. It's an intriguing idea, and it's really been around um, for more than 20 years now, which is incredible. So uh, the, same, the same folks who came up with the original uh, performance-based liquefaction framework, Kramer and Mayfield, they started to fiddle with this idea of a simplified liquefaction hazard analysis that, that closely approximates a performance-based analysis. And they wanted to mimic the approach that the USGS was using for ground motion. So namely... <clears throat> they wanted to create a grid of points across the geographic area, whether it's a, a city or a county or a state or even the entire country. And then they develop a generic soil layer and assume that that soil layer exists everywhere. So for um, Mayfield and Kramer and Huang, they assumed this layer of soil at a depth of six meters with an SPT blow count of 18 with, that was clean, had fines content less than 5%, and then it had these properties of uh, density and um, the soil profile had that average shear wave velocity. So if they then assume that that soil layer exists everywhere, they can perform the performance-based liquefaction triggering analysis for that one layer. 
and they could do it everywhere. So again, this is based on um, a seismic source model. So at, at a base level, we could use the USGS seismic source model to do this um, assessment. Once we've developed, say, factors of safety um, at different return periods now for all those grid points on our, across the region, we can then map those factors of safety or N required values at different targeted return periods. So we could then develop um, what Mayfield and Kramer and Huang called liquefaction parameter maps. I didn't want to call it a liquefaction hazard map, though that would probably be an appropriate term, um, because they, they didn't want to confuse it with the, the existing or the current liquefaction hazard maps that are out there that are based more on liquefaction susceptibility and try to account for the actual soil conditions uh, across the region that's being mapped. No, they, they wanted to be, make it clear that these maps were solely based off of a, um, a parameter or a generic soil layer. So all of these values that are in these liquefaction maps are, are fictional values that are, are basically proxies for seismic loading that affect liquefaction. So when you look at a liquefaction parameter map, it, it doesn't really tell you the actual liquefaction hazard. It tells you the potential for liquefaction to occur if you have liquefiable soils. Hope that makes sense. Okay, and oh, I forgot I've got something there, so let me erase what I wrote. These maps are different from the liquefaction hazard maps as I described because they don't account for actual soil conditions. And then next, Mayfield, Kramer, and Huang, they, they corrected those liquefaction parameter values for site-specific soil conditions and stresses, accounting for things like the depth reduction factor, the stresses in the soil, the amplification of the ground motions, and, and such. Now, um, Kramer and Mayfield and Huang, they, they demonstrated the method for one liquefaction triggering model, and, um, and that was that. It was an intriguing idea. Uh, we saw this approach and thought that this was a very good approach and should be built and expanded upon. And so um, beginning in 2014, uh, our research group at Brigham Young University proposed a major multi-state multi-agency research effort to develop uh, the first set of map-based uniform liquefaction hazard analysis procedures for different liquefaction effects focusing on the standard penetration test. And we were specifically looking at the effects of settlement or volumetric strain, lateral spread, and new mark seismic slope displacement. And that project was a big success. It was very, very popular. It was uh, sponsored by seven different state DOTs, and those states are acknowledged here. Thank you very much for your support. Now, in 2016, a second study was commissioned by a few of these same states, um, namely the state of Connecticut, the state of Utah, the state of South Carolina, and the state of Oregon, they wanted to um, do a similar study, but this time focusing on the CPT instead of the SPT. So as such, we followed the same path, developed similar methods, but we found that the methods were much more complex because like it or not, liquefaction hazard analysis with the CPT is a little more complex because we don't have as much data, uh, physical data about the soil. We're just interpreting a bunch of numbers that we measure from the cone. And so um, 
the purpose of this presentation now is to walk you through the simplified process that we develop for the CPT. So let's start with liquefaction triggering. And, and in liquefaction triggering, I'm only going to focus on one triggering model, the Boulanger and Idris 2014 model. So, um, whoops, let's just say 2014. There's a typo for you. The um, research was kicked off to develop a simplified performance-based procedure for this uh, Boulanger and Idris model. Now, we wanted to follow the framework that Mayfield, Kramer, and Huang introduced in 2010, but we wanted to incorporate a few changes. First, obviously we're dealing with the CPT, we're not dealing with SPT, so that's one obvious uh, change. The second was Mayfield and Kramer and Huang, they were focusing on the Chetan <coughs> seed and others uh, liquefaction triggering model that was published in 2004 and uh, all of their equations that they derived were specific to that model. But uh, for any of you familiar with these models would know that that model has a very different format than other liquefaction triggering models. And so um, when we deal with the Boulanger and Idris model, they have a quadratic equation format in their liquefaction triggering model. And so it requires a different and, and frankly a more complex approach than what Mayfield, Kramer, and Huang did with the Chet and then Seed and others model with the SPT. Now, um, Mayfield and Kramer and Huang, they focused on the N required concept for their simplified method, which is a great concept. But few engineers in practice are familiar with or comfortable still with the, the concept of N required. You'll recall we talked about this in the last lecture or, or two lectures ago. Now, um, Instead, we wanted to focus on a term that more engineers were familiar with, which is the cyclic stress ratio. And so um, that was the direction we went with uh, our uh, model development. And then, of course, um, we needed to change the reference soil profile because now we're using one specific to the CPT, not the SPT. So this was the reference soil profile that we developed for this research, and, and quite frankly, it could have been anything. But we wanted to keep it as consistent with the, the original Mayfield, Kramer, and Huang work as possible, so we kept the depth at six meters for our reference soil profile. We tried to keep um, the, the parameters pretty close to what they had before, um, but we modified them slightly to be more um, optimized with the results that we got later in our uh, research and development. And so this ultimately was the um, generic soil profile that we developed for these methods. So this profile right here, whoops, go back, this is what we would refer to as the reference soil profile. So if you hear me talk about the reference soil profile, I'm talking about that little bit of soil at a depth of six meters that has these properties right here. Okay. So if given a liquefaction triggering model for which CRR is defined as a function of CPT corrected tip resistance, we can see that Q required is just a proxy of the seismic loading. So in other words, if I go back to um, this figure that I was talking about right here, you might recall this from a previous lecture. If I have um, my site and my site has a point with uh, its own, uh, right now I'm showing blow count, let's change this to Q so it's more consistent. Okay, so now we're in CPT space. Okay, now it has therefore the, the corrected CPT tip resistance that I'll call Q site, and it has a CSR that we also calculated for that layer. Now, if I go take that same CSR and I go over to the CRR curve, the Q value that corresponds with 
the CRR curve at a value of CSR is what we call the required CPT tip resistance to trigger liquefaction. Therefore, if Q site is less than Q required, then we have liquefaction. If Q site is greater than Q required, then we have no liquefaction. But look what happens, right? If I take this CRR function and I plug in to the CRR function Q required for my Q value, that's going to give me it's going to return that CSR. So in other words, if CRR is my function and Q required is my input to that function, then the function returns the CSR for my site. So that's all this equation is saying, is that CSR is equal to the CRR with Q required as, as the input. Boulanger and Idris report the CRR function for their equation as this. And that just comes straight from their paper. And then um, I know that the median CRR is going to occur when the probability of liquefaction equals 50%, which if that's the case, then that term right there just goes to zero. So if that's the case, and I have the median probability of, uh, or the median curve, or the probability of liquefaction of 50%, that gives me the median, or the best estimate CRR. And that's given in this equation right here. OK. So now, if we combine those two equations for the median CRR and the relationship for the CSR, we can get the median CSR corresponds to a probability of liquefaction of 50% is equal to that equation when we plug in Q required as our input. So instead now of developing liquefaction parameter maps for Q required, we can develop maps now for this the median CSR instead of Q required. So um, Mayfield, Kramer, and Huang, they developed maps for N required because they were uh, dealing with the standard penetration test. We're developing maps now for CSR. And engineers seem a lot more comfortable characterizing seismic loading with CSR than, than they do really with Q required or N required. So this was based on feedback that we received from um, working with several engineers in implementing these simplified approaches. So um, because these maps that use CSR are, are different than the maps of N required or Q required, we've called them liquefaction loading parameter maps. So everyone knows that we're talking about the loading of um, for liquefaction, the seismic loading. Okay, so these aren't liquefaction hazard maps, these are liquefaction loading parameter maps. So if we solve for that median CSR, assuming the reference soil profile that I introduced to you earlier, then we can develop um, maps for the reference CSR, which we'll call the CSR with a uh, superscript with ref, meaning reference. So if I develop maps for reference CSR values, then I can develop a series of equations to correct that mapped CSR for the reference soil profile to give me a close approximation of the CSR at, for my site at uh, some soil layer I using the following corrections, okay? Where I've got this term, you can see the, from the reference maps, that's from the reference CSRs, the maps that we develop from the liquefaction um, loading reference parameter maps. And then we've got all these other terms that have these deltas in front of them. And all of those delta terms are correction terms, each for things like soil density, site amplification, depth reduction, magnitude scaling factor, and overburden stress.
So what this means is for every layer in my soil profile, I take the same reference parameter value and I just assign to it or add to it these series of little correction functions that I calculate for every layer in my soil profile. And if I add those to that reference parameter, I get the same or very close to the same cyclic stress ratio I would have gotten had I done the full Kramer and Mayfield performance-based procedure with all of those integrals and, and all of those probabilistic equations. So let's just step through the, the steps right now, how you would use this simplified uh, performance-based liquefaction model. Step number one is easy. You go to the maps, the maps that we developed. And uh, I'll introduce the maps to you in the next uh, lecture, in the final lecture of the series, when we talk about the spreadsheet that was developed for you to apply these equations. Um, but right now we're just talking about the theory so you understand what's going on. So first step is you're going to go to these maps and you're going to pull off the reference CSR value. Be aware that um, to, um, to accommodate better um, topographic mapping and contours, we put uh, these maps in terms of percent CSR. Okay, so instead, uh, for instance, you see this says 25. So um, instead of um, that, that would infer 25% uh, or 0.25 CSR. So it, it makes us that we can get a lot more fine contours in all of the mapping that we do. Okay, step number two, once you have your reference CSR, is you start computing all of those delta correction terms. And so for site amplification, here's the function. And you see it's just a simple equation with your uh, site amplification factor that, that you get from code. And remember, this is a function of your site class. Whether you have a site class B, C, D, E, or whatever. Okay. The depth reduction factor, this was uh, derived from Boulanger and Idris's depth reduction factor from their method. And um, in order to use this, it does require that you get an estimate of the magnitude. Now, um, we recommend that you go to the deaggregation uh, at the return period you're interested in, and you use the mean magnitude, not the modal, but the mean magnitude of the PGA from the deaggregation at the return period you're interested in. Here's the uh, correction term for your stresses, both your total and effective stresses, and your soil profile at that depth. Now for the magnitude scaling factor, this one got interesting. Uh, if you're familiar with Boulanger and Idris's work, they introduced a new magnitude scaling factor around 2014 and right off the bat it caused some controversy. There were several researchers out in academia who had some problems with it and they uh, published those concerns and problems. Some of those like uh, Russell Green at Virginia Tech for instance. Um, we, we approached it uh, without any bias uh, but when we looked at our data for the simplified method we found that using the 2014 version of the Boulanger and Idris magnitude scaling factor really produced some wonky, wonky results for us. And so we went back to their original magnitude scaling factor, which was not a function of, rel of relative density of the soil, but was just a function of the magnitude of the earthquake. And using that one, our data turned out great. So <laughs> following in line with um, many other researchers, we, we also uh, recommend, for, at least for the implementation of these simplified methods, to go back and use the 2012 Boulanger and, and uh, Idris magnitude scaling factor from their, uh, their SPT probabilistic relationship. That's the, uh, and that's the one we used in this research. And, and if you use our spreadsheet, that I'll introduce in the next lecture. That's the one that you're going to use in that one too. And um, when we use that magnitude scaling factor, uh, 
the math comes out that the correction factor for magnitude scaling factor is just a simple one. And the reason for that is because the magnitude for your site specific conditions is the same magnitude that it was for the reference conditions. Uh, nothing changed in the in the seismic sources you were considering. So for that reason we can basically eliminate the uh, the consideration of the CSR for the magnitude scaling factor because we get a nice uh, one term there. And here's uh, our correction factor for the overburden factor, K sigma. And you can see the uh, equation right here. Okay, so once you get all of those correction factors and you got your um, reference parameter, loading parameter value from the map for your CSR, the next step is to calculate your median CSR for that particular soil layer. So all you're going to do is sum together all of your correction factors for that particular soil layer and that gives you a total correction, delta CSR, and you're just going to use this equation right here. And that will give you your median CSR for that particular soil layer. Now, the next step was we found for the CPT-based methods that um, there, there started to be a bias or some curve in the data when we started analyzing several cities across the United States and we noticed that that bias was correlated strongly with the the seismic loading uh, as defined by the peak ground acceleration so step number four is we're going to correct for this nonlinear bias in the PEGA using these equations here so you see it's a function of the PGA whether or not you're less than 0.05 G so very very small PGAs moderate PGAs from 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 and then um, larger PGAs uh, greater than or equal to 0.2 G's. If you're larger, you're at the larger PGAs, then there is no correction that you need. So it's really only for the small PGAs that we needed that, that bias correction. Then step number five, you've, you've got your CSR now. So with that CSR, you can just go and take the regular CRR that you're already used to, just the regular median CRR with a probability of liquefaction equal to 50%. And uh, you can plug that in and compute a factor of safety according to this equation for soil layer I. Or you can compute a probability of liquefaction here where uh, we're just going to use a function of the factor of safety. Now um, we recommend using a, a standard deviation of 0.506 in computing your uh, probability of liquefactions and this is different, this is higher than the standard deviation that Boulanger and Idris recommend in their paper. But the reason that we're doing this is that this accounts for the total uncertainty in the liquefaction triggering model. In other words, it accounts for both the parametric uncertainty in your inputs and the model uncertainty itself. So, does it work? Uh, yeah, it does. So, we performed a parametric study where we looked at 10 different cities, five different soil profiles that went down to about 30 meters in depth, and three different return periods and so we had a lot of data to compare against and um, on the y-axis on these plots are the values that we get from our simplified method and the x-axis are the values that we get from the full performance-based procedure with all those integrals and all those calculations now um, this line that goes right up the the diagonal here this this line right here is a one-to-one -one line meaning that points that fall on that line are are a perfect representation of, of y and x meaning that y uh, perfectly approximates x there's a perfect fit 
So here's the data that we see. The, the, this one on the left here is for the Boulanger and Idris method. And then um, even though I didn't walk through the derivation of it with you, I wanted to show you the results of the Robertson and Ride method, uh, the probabilistic version, which was published by Ku and others in 2012. Uh, and you can see the results there. So what we see is that our data falls very, very close to the one-to-one -one line. In general, our trend lines are very close to one. You can see all these trend lines for the three different return periods we analyze, the 475, 1033, and 2475 years. But also look at our R-squared values. They're uh, very high, very close to one. So this means that we have a really good fit and that this simplified triggering uh, approximation method uh, works reasonably well. Now what about uh, post-liquefaction settlement in the free field, so volumetric strains? So in this approach, we're going to simplify the approach that Kramer and others in 2014 introduced for calculating probabilistic estimates of liquefaction settlements. And the way that we're going to do that is first we're going to, again, like before, develop a, a, a grid across the, a region we're interested in and we're going to use the same generic soil profile that we used before and we're going to analyze liquefaction triggering and strain for this generic reference soil layer at six meters and from that we're going to map the resulting strains uh, across the region that we analyzed at different return periods of interest so in this case we're looking at uh, return periods of 475, 1033 years, and 2475 years. And this produces what we call a strain reference parameter map. And then as before, we're going to correct those mapped strain values for site-specific soil conditions. And we're going to do it using this equation right here that we derived that it's based on the reference strain value and some correction factor that we'll call delta epsilon. That is the uh, correction for all of our site-specific soil conditions. And that will give us an approximation of the probabilistic value of our uh, volumetric strain for our site. So let's walk through the steps. Step number one is before you're going to go to the map and you're going to get the reference volumetric strain. Then step number two, we have to calculate the strain correction factor, that delta epsilon. So we, we really dug in and we looked at some different ways to do that and we found something really interesting. That if we take the ratio of the site-specific uh, volumetric strain for our local site condition that we're interested in uh, relative to the reference strain value but do it in the pseudo probabilistic format that uh, I was just uh, railing against and, and attacking a, a few lectures ago um, we found that this ratio actually gets you really really close to the true ratio even though you're only using the pseudo probabilistic method and so uh, we recommend calculating or closely approximating this correction factor using these terms and the pseudo probabilistic approach and um, as we are summarized in an earlier lecture uh, from the Ishihara and Yoshimini data the volumetric strain is calculated uh, using these approximate equations right here. Then, step number three, we're going to take that site uh, volumetric strain that we calculated and we're going to calibrate it again for the bias that we see relative to the ground motion. So in this case, if my peak ground acceleration is less than 0.2 g, I'm going to adjust my uh, volumetric strain for my site that I got according to this adjustment. Or if it's greater than or equal to, then I'm going to adjust it uh, like this.
So that gives us our calibrated volumetric strain. And then step four, once I have the cali calibrated volumetric strain, I can calculate the probabilistic settlement at the ground surface using uh, a modification of the Zhuang and others 2013 method for the CPT. And we're going to use this equation right here. Where again, that delta Z is going to be the thickness of um, the, the corresponding layer uh, that, that corresponds to the calibrated volumetric strain. So all we're doing is multiplying strain times layer thickness, summing them up, and then multiplying them by our bias correction factor. So does this method work? Uh, the short answer is yes, it does work. You can see that, uh, again, our Y values are from our simplified method are um, reasonably close to the full performance-based procedures of Kramer and others 2014. Um, but it didn't work quite as well as we hoped it would. But here are a few things that we did notice. So for instance, if we're at, at peak ground accelerations less than 0.2 Gs, um, there was quite a bit of scatter around there. You can see, especially at low return periods, we have an R squared of about 0.89. So that means that we do have some scatter around that one-to-one -one line. The, the higher return periods were quite a bit tighter, which was good. Um, but you know, especially for predicted settle or predicted settlements less than about, I'd say less than about 10 centimeters, it's uh, really reliable. Once you get above 10 centimeters and your PGA is less than about 0.2 g, there there might be a little bit of error there, but not much. Now, if your PGA is greater than 0.2 g's, it it actually gave us some pretty good results all the way up to about, uh, I'd say about 30 centimeters or so, we saw some really tight fit with that one-to-one -one line. Once you get above 30 centimeters, we saw the, the, the potential to have some deviation in our predictions. Now remember, these plots are for the Boulanger and Idris 2014 factor of safety. If we look at the Robertson and Ride method instead, we see a little bit more scatter than we saw with Boulanger and Idris. Uh, we see, tend to see a little bit of over prediction in small settlements with uh, PGAs that are greater than 0.2 G, but it, it evens itself out once you get out to about 30 or 40 centimeters of predicted settlement. Uh, and then at low PGAs, again, right up to about you know 10, 10 centimeters, the data is pretty good. So even though there is some scatter, I, I want to I highlight and emphasize that this simplified performance-based result still gives us less scatter than we would get from the conventional pseudo-probabilistic methods that most of you are probably implementing right now in your projects. OK, last but not least, lateral spread displacement. So let's walk through the simplified performance-based procedure for that. As before, we're going to create a grid across a region we're interested in. We're going to use our generic reference soil profile with the reference soil layer. And we're going to perform a performance-based lateral spread assessment for all of those grid points for that reference soil layer. Once we have that done, we can then map the targeted uh, the, the targeted, uh, it, it's actually not lateral spreads we're mapping, we're, we're mapping shear strains because we're dealing with this, the CPT. So we, we map probabilistic versions of, of maximum shear strain at targeted return periods, and we're going to call this a shear strain reference parameter map. And then based on that, we can correct those shear strains for site-specific soil and topographic conditions using an equation of the format like this, where A and B are, uh, are coefficients that, that we solve for. Uh, you don't have to. We already did it. And of course, the, the reference shear strain that comes from our map. So let's walk through the steps to apply this method. So we're going to go to the strain reference parameter map. 
that we developed for the region of interest. And from that, you're going to pull off the reference shear strain. Okay. Then once you have the reference shear strain, you are going to um, compute the correction factor for the strain, this delta gamma term. And uh, again, as before, we're going to use the pseudo-probabilistic approach that I told you to never ever use. And you're going to use that uh, to approximate this correction term. So you're going to compute the maximum shear strain for your site divided by the race, divided by the maximum shear strain for that reference soil profile using the pseudo-probabilistic procedure. And then, uh, and you're going to get those shear strains from the Ishihara and Yoshimini relationship. Uh, now, there are a series of equations that, that Zhang and, and Robertson and others provided in the, the end of their publication. Um, though there's too many equations to write here on the screen, so I'm just showing the, the figure from Ishihara and Yoshimini, but this figure has been digitized, so um, you can get the, the functions to uh, solve for these curves in a spreadsheet if you go to their paper. Next, you need to compute the site-specific maximum shear strain gamma site max, and you're going to do that using uh, this equation right here, where uh, here's your correction term that you just solved for in the previous step. And you use the reference shear strain, but you use the pseudo-probabilistic equation to approximate it. Now, um, you have to limit it according to these limits, by the way, uh, where it's zero if your shear strain is less than or equal to zero. Um, if it's between 0 and 51.2, then it's just the value you computed. If it's greater than or equal to 51.2, then you cap your shear strain at 51.2%. Then you've got to calibrate it again for that ground motion bias that we discussed earlier. And here are the equations to do that. And then the next step is once you have the calibrated shear strains, you're going to go to uh, the Zhang and others method, and you're going to compute the lateral displacement index, or LDI. And then once you have LDI, the final step is you can compute the lateral spread displacement for your soil profile for either a ground slope case, using that equation right there, or for a free face case using that equation right there. So let's look at the results. Uh, on the left are the results when we use the Boulanger and Idris factors of safety, and on the right are when we use the Robertson and Ride factors of safety. You can see that uh, we get less scatter with Boulanger and Idris, and up to about five meters or so, we have a very strong a uh, good linear approximation from our simplified approach to the full performance-based approach. Right up here to about f five meters or so of predicted lateral spread displacement. Uh, for Robertson and Ride, we see more scatter, but I would say right up to, oh, maybe 1.5 or two meters, it's pretty, pretty reliable. Once it gets past that, we see a little bit more scatter but it, the average is still a good approximation, as you can see. So, all in all, the simplified procedure that we present using these maps is a good, a reasonable approximation of the full performance-based procedure. And it allows you to not have to do your own iterative calculations with those probabilistic equations. So, the, the, the final gist of what I'm trying to tell you here is that now you can enjoy the benefits of a performance-based procedure on your everyday projects now without requiring specialized software, without requiring um, understanding of how to do the math in these performance-based procedures. All you need are the reference parameter maps and then these simplified correction equations. 
and with those you can develop good approximations of what you would calculate anyway if you did the full performance-based procedure. We developed these procedures for the CPT-based methods for liquefaction triggering, for lateral spread displacement, and post-liquefaction settlement. And we see that the methods we developed show good approximation of the full performance-based procedures. Now, um, prior to my recording this video, um, the missing piece of this research was the development of the reference parameter maps for all the states in the United States. At that time, only the states that funded this research had maps developed for them. But, but since that time, very recently, like within the last week or two, we've uh, acquired and secured uh, some funding, and we plan to develop the reference parameter maps for the entire United States uh, using the 2014 USGS seismic source model. So we will develop maps uh, here in 2021 and early 2022 for the CPT-based uh, methods, and then 2022 and 2023 for the SPT-based methods for every state in the United States. So that's some good news. All right, next lecture will be the final lecture, and it's simply going to be just a screen share where I'm going to walk through and introduce you to the spreadsheet that we developed to implement these methods. Maybe you sat here kind of zombie-faced looking at these equations I was showing you going, I don't have no idea how to implement these equations. And that's okay. You don't have to because we built a tool for you to implement those equations on your projects. And in the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through how to use that tool, and I'm going to show you where you can get that tool. So, until then, thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to talking with you in the next lecture.